Dubai take you now? To see where Dubai takes you now, visit DubaiPresents.com. How would you like a 15% discount to my daily email, the stack of stuff, the show notes, discounts to the conference, all of that? All you need to do is text the word SHOW to 33777. You'll get the annual subscription with a 15% discount to my daily email. You'll get the stack of stuff, the links to the show notes, discounts to the conference, and so much more. All you have to do is text the word SHOW, S-H-O-W, to 33777. Text SHOW to 33777. Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show podcast, Hour 3. Hello, America. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here across the nation. The phone number is 877-973-7425. If you want to be on the program, it's an open line Friday. I got people on the phones, but before I get to them, I've been telling you I would talk about Iowa, and I will, because... We need to talk about Iowa. We're less than 96 hours from the Iowa caucuses. If you believe the polling, and most of you don't, I'm in the minority. I tend to think the polling, when you take the polling average, at least not the individual polls, but the polling average, you get a pretty good sense of where the race is. And it's a dominant Trump lead. I said on Twitter a while back I thought Ron DeSantis could win the caucuses. I expect to be humiliated uh, on caucus day because Donald Trump should win. Now, if you listen to the various campaigns, they will tell you why they think they're going to win, particularly the DeSantis campaign. And he does make a lot of sense. DeSantis's supporters, and again, look at the average of polls, not the polls themselves. And the average kind of weeds out the bad polling. The DeSantis supporters, the polling averages show, are more uh, engaged. They're more determined than even the Trump supporters. It was notable the other day, and it was little noticed, but the McLaughlins, uh, John and Jimmy, uh, I, I know uh, Jimmy in particular was the very first pollster I ever worked with. Uh, they're, they're good people, and they are Donald Trump's pollster. John is in particular. John, John McLaughlin is, is Trump's pollster, and put out a poll that had it a 10-point race in Iowa with Nikki Haley in second place. Little notice. Did you, have you heard about this? Did you pay attention to it? Yes, a, a 10-point race, not, not a 50-point race, not a 20-point race, a 10-point race. Now, here's what I actually think is happening with this poll. They got to set expectations. The polling shows like a 30 or 40-point lead for Donald Trump right now. If he does only get 10 point, if he does only win by 10 points, well, the media is going to view that as, as a bad thing for Donald Trump because they've been even Trump on the campaign stage. Trump's been saying, I'm 50 points ahead. I'm, I'm 30 points ahead, whatever. So if he's only 10 points ahead, so the Trump campaign's got to release a poll that shows a narrow race to incentivize his voters getting out. He's got to make sure they know about it so they get out so that he does win by 20 points. I don't know that Nikki Haley is in second place, although she has certainly had upward momentum in that race, and the DeSantis campaign has kind of floundered about. However, here's what the DeSantis people say. This is their theory of the race. Yes, it's true that they've kind of stagnated in the polling. They're not disputing the polling. Uh, It's it's always funny to me how, how you guys dispute the polling and the campaigns never do. And the polling shows DeSantis not great, but in second place in Iowa, but the polling doesn't poll operations. DeSantis has a very strong operation in Iowa. DeSantis is organized in about 1,600, 1,500 precincts out of 1,600 some odd precincts. He's got a better organization and more precincts than any other candidate, including Trump. According to the polls out there, DeSantis supporters are most likely to go to the polls. However, there's a wrinkle. The weather. Now, the weather in Iowa at this time of year, it's always bad. The weather in Iowa is always bad. It's 
never good in uh, January. The funniest thing is that all the campaign signs are now buried under snow. Um, they're already eight inches on the ground, and it's piling up. It's a very, very bad weather front. The thing that's moving to the southeast, causing all the storms here, uh, dr the drop in temperature here, it's already blowing through Iowa. Iowa Republicans, according to the Associated Press, will likely confront temperatures dripping below zero degrees when they kick off the 2024 election cycle, a record-breaking forecast that might complicate candidates' hopes of making their own history if the cold depresses turnout. The candidates are publicly expressing optimism that their supporters will show up no matter how bad the weather is, but the snow and cold have already wrecked havoc on their schedules. Donald Trump's campaign had to cancel events featuring surrogates advocating for the former president, including Mike Huckabee and Arkansas Governor Sarah Sanders, his daughter. Vivek Ramaswamy said his car got stuck in a ditch while driving in snowy weather Monday night in Des Moines from northwest Iowa. Ramaswamy canceled events Tuesday morning after ridiculing Nancy, uh, Nancy, uh, Nikki Haley for canceling events. Nikki Haley canceled events because of the weather, and Vivek Ramaswamy accused her of not being able to stand up to China if she couldn't stand up to snow, and then he had to cancel events because of the snow. The National Weather Service data shows there's never been a colder Iowa caucus night than what's forecast for January 15th. The previous coldest was 2004 when the high temperature was 16 degrees. We may not warm above zero degrees on Monday, says Des Moines-based meteorologist Chad Hahn. I would not be surprised if we don't get above minus 20 degrees for wind chills beginning on Sunday. Temperatures will continue to drop through the rest of the week, Han said. Highs will be in the upper 20s Wednesday, low 20s on Thursday and Friday, 10 on Saturday, single-digit Sunday, worse with wind chills. The frigid feels like may make it harder for Republican candidates to turn out their supporters, already a tall order with the demands of the caucus. Unlike a primary, where voters cast their ballot through the day, caucus goers have to show up at a specific time and location that's likely not their typical polling place. No snow, rain, or sleet is expected Monday, and snow tends to be less likely with temperatures that low. Barring an ice storm, Iowans shouldn't be dissuaded from low temperatures, says Jeff Kaufman, the Republican Party chair in Iowa. Now, here's the thing. Iowans are used to the cold. You and I may not be, but they are. I've been to the Iowa caucus before when I was at CNN I had to cover the Iowa caucuses. And then when I was at Fox, I went to the Iowa caucuses. And it was cold. Uh, I went, the year I went to the Iowa caucuses for CNN, I want to say it was 90, 20 degrees. It was cold, very cold. It was actually warmer. The, the time I went for Fox, I guess that would have been 2016 for Fox. I went to the Iowa caucuses and it was it was above freezing. But they're used to it there. The thing is, though, uh, the people, the, the candidate with the oldest supporters, they may have the hardest time going when it's that cold. Essentially, um, the older voters are more impacted by the very cold weather. And you listen to the Haley camp, the DeSantis camp, they both say, well, Trump's got the oldest voters. But Trump's got the most voters. So he should still win. I mean, the reality is Donald Trump should win the caucuses, and he should win in New Hampshire. If Donald Trump wins the caucuses, he probably does win New Hampshire. If Donald Trump doesn't win the caucuses, it's not fatal to him, but it gives Nikki Haley life in New Hampshire. Plus, you got Chris Christie's dropped out of New Hampshire. Chris Christie's dropped out uh, of the race. A lot of his voters were drifting to Nikki Haley anyway. And with the drift in voters to Nikki Haley, she could get very close to Trump. You, it, it depends on who you believe. Now, I, I will tell you the God's honest truth. Donald Trump is probably going to be the nominee. He's probably going to win the caucuses. And I don't know that you're going to see the other candidates drop out. Because if Donald Trump is found guilty in the documents trial, that will shake up the race. And you're going to have to have a nominee. The DeSantis campaign has hinted he may not drop out. Frankly, I do think if Haley comes in ahead of DeSantis in Iowa, DeSantis should drop out. Now, I know 
my friends who are DeSantis supporters get very defensive. I, I got to tell you, um, the DeSantis supporters at this point are more hypersensitive on social media than the Trump supporters. Uh, life is too short to be that hypersensitive. But my gosh, you, you offer any sort of criticism? Like like the other day, uh, I mentioned that, that debate in Iowa between DeSantis and Haley that neither of them were playing to win. They were playing for second place. And it stands for, oh, you're, you used to be a conservative. You must be bought and paid for by somebody to say something like that, not back of the real conservative Ron Sanders. Nope, I'm just telling you as I saw it, his campaign hadn't done very well. And if he comes in third place in Iowa, he should drop out. I don't know whether he will, but his campaign poured everything they had into building Iowa. They're telling everybody they can still win because of the structure. If he's in third place, he's toast. It doesn't matter. He's toast. If Haley comes in second in Iowa, she might as well stay in and try to rebound it in New Hampshire. But if you were a betting person, I don't know why you wouldn't be betting on Trump at this point. You may not want him. I mean, I would prefer someone else, but I see where this thing is headed. His supporters are the most committed and the most passionate. The question is, and, and this is the thing, this, uh, it, this is really the thing. Donald Trump supporters are the most likely to say we got to be prepared to fight. We, we, we got we to gotta take it to the left. Um, we, 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 you know, you, you got to stock up on, on guns and ammo. The country's going to hell. Fight, fight, fight. Donald Trump fights for us. Will they show up in the cold in Iowa? Or is it all talk? We're going to find out in less than 96 hours. Can y'all believe we're finally here? The votes are finally going to be cast and we'll see. Is it, is it a figment? Are the polls wrong? Are you guys right? Are the polls wrong or are the polls, are the polls right? Y'all wrong. Is the DeSantis theory of the race, is it going to stack up? How good is his organization? An organization on paper that's really good isn't necessarily an organization that actually is good when it comes to performance on the ground, particularly when you're having record-breaking gold. We'll find out. Can DeSantis get people there? Can he hold the crowd? And what of Nikki Haley? There hasn't been a lot of last-minute polling in Iowa to show any momentum shifts. The Haley campaign is convinced that they've gotten ahead of DeSantis in Iowa. If so, DeSantis is toast. But if DeSantis wins, if his theory of the race holds, the race is completely shaken up. If DeSantis' theory of the race holds and he wins, he should get momentum out of it because he will show the polls were wrong and the base is with him. But that's if. There are lots of ifs. And in 96 hours, there will be no more ifs. We will have a strong sense of the race. We will know what reality aligns. We will know which pollsters were right, which were wrong, who we should pay attention to. And if you're putting bets on the race, you'd be insane not to bet on Donald Trump. Because Trump has a strong level of support among the grassroots Republicans. They are loyal to him and committed to him. They won't turn out for other people, but they'll turn out for Donald Trump. The question remains... Will they turn out for Donald Trump when it's negative 30 outside? In 96 hours, we'll find out next Tuesday on this program. It's going to be a wild ride. You know, Monday as well, it's MLK. Um, I'm off on Monday. On Tuesday, we'll have a lot to analyze here and see what happens. If Trump wins Iowa, Trump's the nominee. If he doesn't win Iowa, well, can he bar the door? It, it, we'll see how this he, He's just still odds on favorite. But if he doesn't win Iowa... It shakes everything up. And that's the DeSantis theory of the race. We'll find out if it's right on Monday. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hello there. Welcome. It's Eric Erickson here. Coming up, Dave McCormick from Pennsylvania should be the Republican nominee up there, I hope. Uh, barely lost to uh, Mehmet Oz. Uh, he's going to run again against uh, Casey up there, who, you know, it, what's so funny is Fetterman and Josh Shapiro both came out against Biden taking down the statue of William Penn in the park up there. Uh, Casey said absolutely nothing, took no stand on it. Uh, McCormick challenged him. Uh, before we get there, though, Pierce, you're going to be up next. Welcome to the show, Pierce. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Eric? Great. What's going on? Well, 
I'm worried about November, and I'll tell you why. The ineptitude of the Republicans in the House of Representatives to do anything other than Biden this and Biden that, um, I'm afraid they're going to hand the 2024 election to the Democrats. White House, you know, I, the House I, I, of Representatives, so, and more Senate seats. All right. I, I'm glad you say this because because I hadn't had time to get there, and, and I've wanted to talk about this today. Um, it, you know, it, part of the problem here, Pierce, is we got to deal with what is reality versus what is excuse making? Because I hear all the time, and, and I used to be guilty of it all the time as well, say this is an excuse. You're not getting anything done, and, and here's your excuse. Uh, it, it's not an excuse. It is reality that we have a three-seat majority in the House, and the moderates and the conservatives and the GOP hate each other. And it's not an excuse. It is the reality that uh, Republican primary voters nominated a bunch of crappy candidates in 2022 who the Democrats uh, slaughtered at the polls. They're not going to get anything done. They're headed into campaign season. They're not going to get anything done. Uh, what what use is a majority? The only use of it is stopping the Democrats from doing anything they want. The reality, not the excuse, the reality is if we want to improve the situation, we got to find better primary candidates. Uh, take Bo Hines. Bo Hines in North Carolina in 2022. He had Marjorie Taylor Greene's endorsement. He had Donald Trump's endorsement. He was running in a Republican district, and the Republican voters nominated him, and the um, independent voters in that district sided with the Democrats. And a Republican district has a Democratic congressman now in North Carolina because Republican primary voters voted for Bo Hines, who decided to scream and whine about the 2020 election instead of the future. So Republican voters who are frustrated with the House of Representatives need to blame their fellow Republican voters who nominated a bunch of crappy candidates in 2022. Vote for better candidates and win. It's possible. Conservatives can win. Conservatives can win in, in swing districts if they have the right message and they don't dwell on 2022. That, that's, that's my great frustration. With the Republicans right now who are claiming, well, they're, they're, we're not doing anything in the House. No, we're not, because we have a three-seat majority. And I didn't particularly care for Kevin McCarthy, but people didn't listen to me, and they made him speaker. And once he was speaker, he actually got the moderates and the conservatives to agree to a massive round of spending cuts for government. But eight Republicans, including Matt, led by Matt Gates, ousted him. They rejected the cuts and ousted McCarthy. So guess what? McCarthy left. And now you got another Republican, uh, Congressman Johnson, I think, from Wyoming. He's left to become the, a college president. Uh, uh, George Santos got kicked out of Congress. So now you have a three-seat majority, about to be a two-seat majority. Good luck getting anything done with a two-seat majority. When the moderates agreed with conservatives to do cuts, the populists betrayed them all with the ouster of Kevin McCarthy. Nobody trusts anybody anymore. That's the reality. That's not an excuse. That's the reality. That's what you're dealing with. So good luck getting anything done. You want to get something done? Don't give up. Get even in the primaries. Find competent candidates. Don't find people out for revenge. Find people who can win. Don't do the Bo Hines, Joe Kent, uh, John Gibbs uh, of the world or the Mehmet Oz's, or the Blake Masters, or the Herschel Walkers, find people who could win. I mean, here in Georgia, every single person listed knows, I was telling you all in the primaries, Herschel Walker was not going to be a viable general election candidate. They were going to eat him alive. Was, no, 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 it's Herschel Walker, it's Herschel Walker. Who cares what you think, Erickson? You just hate Trump. Guess what happened? He got eaten alive at the polls. I was right. Nobody wants to, you just picking bad people in the primaries and then wondering why you're losing general elections and we only have a three-seat majority now. Stop picking crap candidates in primaries. I'll introduce you to a great candidate on the other side of this break you should support. Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino-style games that you can play for free anytime anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day a little. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Welcome nationwide. It's Eric Erickson here. It's an open line Friday, 877-973-7425. Though hold the lines. I have a guest. We're going to do the gathering again this year in Atlanta. 
Last year, I invited my next guest, and he he pulled the whole, it's my birthday weekend, don't think I can come excuse. So we've moved it. Maybe we can get him to come this year because I really like him. He's going to be a great candidate. I have told you guys over and over and over, part of the problem in 2022 is Republican voters in primaries didn't necessarily get the best candidates. And the Democrats, of course, funded bad Republican candidates got them the nomination and then wiped us out. Now we got a three seat majority in the House of Representatives and we lost the Senate. We have the opportunity to take the Senate in 2024. And the road to the Senate runs through the great state of Pennsylvania. And we have a great potential nominee in Pennsylvania named Dave McCormick, who's joining me by phone. How are you? Hey, Eric, how are you? I'm great. Um, delighted to have you with me, first of all. Governor Kemp, by the way, says to tell you hello. Oh, he's a great man. Yeah, George is lucky to have such a great governor. He is. He is. Now, I want Pennsylvania to have you next year, or this year, I guess it is. Uh, and, and in the run-up to this election, uh, I know you've been to Israel. I say I've, I've, I grew up in the Middle East, and I've never been to Israel. I couldn't uh, by virtue of having grown up in, a, in an Arab country, wasn't allowed to go, and at some point, want to go, but what's it like over there right now? It was such a, an emotional trip, Eric. I, you know, I went. My my wife and I decided to go uh, just over the holidays, where uh, I was talking about Israel and being asked about it, and I, I have strong views on the need to show solidarity, but I wanted to see it for myself. And uh, she had worked in the Trump administration on the Abraham Accords, so she had some good connections there, and and so we we went and. Uh, uh, what we witnessed was sort of th- things you can't forget. We walked through uh, one of the communities that was brutalized on October 7th, uh, Kofar Aza, which had, um, you know, 100 people murdered, 700 in the community, uh, buildings burned with families in them, uh, uh, children watching their father be killed, uh, beheadings. It was just uh, brutal. We met with a uh, a, a young woman who had been shot at the music festival. Um, she uh, had been shot through the knee and was left for dead in a bomb shelter. And she was hidden under the bodies of, of some of her colleagues who were killed. And that was the only reason the terrorists missed her. We met with some hostage families and talked about the tragedy of wondering about their loved ones who have been gone for more than 90 days. So it was the kind of thing that just highlighted that this was pure evil absolute evil uh, in the form of Hamas and evil that was really underwritten by Iran, um, that Iran is, is funding these proxies all over the Middle East, uh, the Houthis, uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, ha- Hamas um, Islamic Jihad, and, and uh, Iran is able to do that because President Obama and President Biden have supported uh, releasing uh, the sanctioned funds to over $100 billion to Iran. And my opponent, Bob Casey, in this race was the deciding vote on this. And so you see what a bad decision has done in terms of promoting evil across the Middle East. And that evil is not just focused on Israel. It's focused on destroying the West. And so I left with a lot of conviction on the need to support Israel and the need to, to really fight back and destroy um, not only uh, Hamas, but uh, but but evil more broadly across the Middle East. Well, I, I, I'm glad you're able to relate that personally because I, I got to be honest with you. I was invited to see the uh, video footage they put together of the atrocities from October 7th, and I had already seen parts of it, and I just didn't want the fullness of that in my head. The the horrors yeah. of what they did, uh, and it just it continues to be notable to me that even, for example, your opponent. Um, it seems to very much want Israel to to do something about Gaza and, and never seems to want to call on Hamas to surrender. Yeah, the, um, the film you refer to is 47 minutes, and it's taken largely from the body cams of the terrorists mm-hmm. that were killed and some of the cameras in the uh, communities which were where the slaughter took place. And uh, as you said, it's the kind of thing you can't unsee it, uh, but it's it's unbelievably graphic, and it just shows – this is a kind of evil that you can't live side by side. You can't have a negotiated settlement and then have people that uh, decapitated your neighbors living 600 meters across the border. So um, uh, I agree with you. I think Senator Casey has obviously been part of the problem because he supported the uh, Iran deal. But more than that, he's been he's been very weak 
in responding to this crisis. He's not been a voice of moral clarity. He's not been a voice that has called out our leaders like Summer Lee in Congress, who he's endorsed, who's been anti-Semitic, it's, uh, who's called out uh, Liz McGill, who's the president uh, that stepped down from University of Pennsylvania, who, who handled this whole situation so terribly. And, um, and this is a real test. This is a real test of the ability to show what's good and bad and, and what's evil and have the strength uh, to, to call it out. In the case of Hamas and what's happening, um, you know, it's terrible that you're, you're seeing these civilian casualties in Gaza. It's, ab- it's absolutely terrible. I'm heartbroken when I see uh, innocent women and children who are being harmed. But uh, I'll say two things. When I was in Israel, I met with a number of senior military officials, I, I actually sat through an, an operation and watched uh, a, a drone unit uh, conducting some of its targeting. And uh, the amount of care, not only to ensure that they're adhering to international law, but also double authentication to make sure they have dual sources of intel, intel to ensure that they're only targeting terrorists. I was very impressed. There's no doubt in my mind that uh, the Israeli military is, is doing everything it can to minimize civilian casualties. But the second thing is Hamas is to blame. I mean, if you look what's happening, mm-hmm. they're embedding themselves with, uh, the, with the civilian population, with the innocents, in hospitals, in schools. They're blocking humanitarian aid going to Hamas, going to uh, the Gazan citizens, rather. And they're blocking innocents from going to the safe zones that the Israelis have set up. So um, if there's a guilty party here that uh, Senator Casey should be calling out, it's Hamas. As the, uh, uh, as, the, as the group that is absolutely to fault, and uh, he's not been able to do that. Now, I, I want to shift a little bit, if, if we can, because you mentioned the University of Pennsylvania situation. You're, you're running to be a senator there. I, I know you went to the military academy and, and then to Princeton. I, your dad was, wasn't he like the chancellor for higher ed in, in Pennsylvania for a he time? He was for the public school system, yes, sir. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I'm kind of like, I, I've got a lot of friends who went to the University of Pennsylvania, and I was kind of flabbergasted to see a, a state school in Pennsylvania. Um, it, it Just the, the level of rabid anti-Semitism on that campus yeah. and the, 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 the board at first circling the wagons around McGill is just kind of striking to me. Absolutely. I mean, that was a, a failure. And University of Pennsylvania, of course, is one of, of the three Ivy Leagues. Uh, that were on, you know, that were the testimony that day, and and here you have, you know, what are supposedly some of the finest universities in the world, and their leaders, their leaders were so twisted into a pretzel uh, by uh, this progressive ideology that defines the world in terms of the oppressed and the oppressors, that they ultimately couldn't even say the most basic, simple thing about. Um, uh, that that the idea of genocide and students on campus marching and promoting that uh, would be against the university's uh, code of conduct and behavior that should be stopped, and uh, and and that just showed, I think, a moral deficit in the bankruptcy, frankly, of uh, of uh, the progressive ideology which has permeated these university campuses, and you know universities should be a place where um, you can have a free exchange of ideas, but that, uh, but at the same time, all groups are protected equally from hate and anti-Semitic behavior. Uh, and and that, just, that just didn't come through in that testimony. And I, you know, I think when you look at those universities, they've lost their way in terms of teaching American history. They've lost their way in terms of, uh, of, of a sense of, a, of an environment that uh, – has become increasingly woke and hijacked by an ideology that permeates every aspect of the institution. So I think it was a real wake-up call to a lot of donors, a real wake-up call to a lot of graduates. And I think it's made many of us just step back and ask ourselves how we can reform the institutions that are really shaping the minds of our kids, not just universities, of course, but, but also our public schools. Now, I, I got to pivot and throw a bit of a wild card at you, and I will confess um, – I am a member of your wife's fan club. Um, I, I, your, your, your wife is so deeply impressive to me. And for those who don't know, she immigrated to this country as a, as a child, didn't speak English, 
became a deputy national security advisor for Donald Trump, actually created a position for her in national security. And it's just an amazing uh, foreign policy skills and the Abraham Accord. And we've got this massive argument in this country over legal immigration and illegal immigration. And here is your wife who legally immigrated to this country, assimilated to this country, became an advisor to the president of the United States, living the American dream. I got to imagine that her background and what you see going on really shapes your opinions on what we're seeing with this mass wave of illegal immigration coming into this country. Absolutely. And, you know, her, her, as you said, her, she immigrated from Egypt. Her father was a, uh, an officer in the Egyptian military and he moved his family to America. So they not only had the American dream, but could practice their Christian religion freely, uh, at which they, which they weren't necessarily able to do, uh, in, in Egypt in, increasingly. And so she and, and, and they have lived the American dream and illegally, as you've said, and it's the legal immigrants that sometimes are so opposed to what they're seeing on the border. And, and what we're seeing on the border is an absolute travesty. And it, it's, it's one of the top issues that Pennsylvanians are worried about because you have millions of illegal immigrants. I went to visit the border uh, during my last campaign. I saw it firsthand, the cartels up in the hedgerow sending folks across the Rio Grande. And, um, and what we see now is, is having huge impact on Pennsylvanians. It's not only uh, creating a huge burden on social services in places where illegal immigrants are showing up in Philadelphia and elsewhere, but beyond that, it's a major contributor to the fentanyl crisis. And the fentanyl crisis, that the, the ingredients of fentanyl come from China. They're, it's manufactured in Mexico. It comes across the border, managed by the distribution of the cartels, through much of it through illegal immigration. It takes about 48 hours for it to get to northeastern uh, United States. And it's going down the, the highways on Route 80 and Route 81, right where I grew up in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania. We lost 5,000 people last year in Pennsylvania from fentanyl and opioids. 106,000 uh, nationwide. So this is a crisis of epic proportion, and it all goes to the open border. One final word, which I'm sure you've seen uh, on, on this, Eric, but in a time when you have terrorist attacks around, um, around the world, we had 160 people that were apprehended at the border. These are just the folks that were apprehended who were on the terrorist watch list. One only can imagine how many people crossed into the United States who, who were on the terrorist watch list that weren't apprehended. And this poses a growing risk to our national security. So this uh, border uh, is a travesty. Uh, we need to return uh, to the policies of President Trump. And what's happened under President Biden is, uh, you know, is absolutely inexcusable. And it's one of the reasons I've called for, as many have, the uh, impeachment of Mayorkas, because I think – He's been an absolute failure and has mm -hmm. misled the American people on the conduct of, uh, of border policy. Now, folks, if you're just tuning in, I'm talking to Dave McCormick. He's running for the Senate in Pennsylvania against Bob Casey. So we've got about a minute here. If people want to find out more about your campaign, if they want to support you, I hope they will nationwide. People should be supporting you. Such a great chance to pick up the seat. What should they do? Thank you, Eric. It's uh, Dave McCormick, PA.com. Um, I am running a race to uh, be the, the senator from Pennsylvania against Bob Casey, who's been a rubber stamp for Joe Biden 98 percent of the time. Um, 17 years in the Senate hasn't had a consequential accomplishment. And this Senate will not only be uh, this Senate will not only be critical for Pennsylvania, it'll be critical to flipping the Senate and really taking our country in the right direction. So I'd uh, be grateful for any support your listeners could could offer. And I'm always grateful to be on the phone with you and on your show. So thank you, sir. Absolutely. You, happy New Year to you, and thanks so much for stopping by. And I'll tell Dina you said those nice things, Eric. Thank you. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. Tell her I said hi. Thank you so much. Dave McCormick, uh, running for the Senate of Pennsylvania. Y'all, this is a must-win seat for the GOP, and he is a great candidate. He lost the primary in 2022 by a tenth of a point. At the end, it, he had won early voting. Uh, he lost same-day voting. It wound up being a tenth of a point after Donald Trump endorsed him at Oz. And he's willing to come back and run against Bob Casey. Uh, he's lined up Republican support nationwide. He needs our support. He'd be a great candidate. He'd be a good conservative candidate. His wife, by the way, really is. I am, I'm in the Dina Powell fan club. She's, she's incredible. Donald Trump created a position for her to be the national security strategic advisor. 
uh, and she helped develop the Abraham Accords. Uh, Coptic Christian whose family fled Egypt without learning, knowing any English, they came here, learned the language, became Americans, loved this country. Um, what a what a a just fantastic couple all around. Dave McCormick, uh, Dave McCormick, PA dot com is the website. Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day a little. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Friends, we must relive a real blast from the past because 20 years ago, 20 years ago this coming week, America got one of the original great memes. It was just as the internet was becoming a thing. We got this. You know something? Not only are we going to New Hampshire, Tom Harkin, we're going to South Carolina and Oklahoma and Arizona and North Dakota and New Mexico. We're going to California and Texas and New York. And we're going to South Dakota and Oregon and Washington and Michigan. And then we're going to Washington, D.C. to take back the White House. Yeah! Yeah! Howard Dean, 20 years ago in the Democratic caucuses. Yeah! That clip went so viral, my gosh. And also, that clip pretty much destroyed his campaign. The I mean, he wasn't going to go anywhere, if we're honest. But that uh, scream at the end just kind of wiped out his campaign early on. <laughs> He was, I mean, he had all the momentum. Progressives rallied around Howard Dean in 2004. They were convinced that Howard Dean was the man, and he completely imploded representing the progressive wing of the party. Now, interestingly enough, Dean's campaign inspired a bunch of progressives to get involved in politics, and 20 years later, they pretty successfully taken over the Democratic Party. He became the, um, he became the, um, the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, among other things, it it's remarkable that uh, Dean was able to advance in politics as he did. Then it became an MSNBC contributor. Uh, but yeah, twenty years ago, the Dean scream. What a what a a famous soundbite in time for those of you who are political junkies. Now here at the end, I, I got to tell you, as we're headed into this three day weekend, the Iowa caucus is coming up Monday. Uh, I'm looking at the wind chill map right now. The wind chill in northwest Iowa. Let me let me give you a precise. Uh, we're talking uh, the Sioux City area um, and Sioux Falls, North Dakota. We got listeners up in Sioux Falls. Uh, it is negative twenty degrees right now. Negative twenty degrees. Those of you up in uh, Grand Forks, North Dakota. Your wind chill right now, you're listening to us up there. It is negative 20 degrees for you. And further inland, it's negative 37 degrees in northern North Dakota right now, uh, near Minot, North Dakota. It, it's it's freezing. And it's only going to get worse. Congratulations, those of you who have decided to live up north. It is only going to get worse for you. Uh, good Lord, Charlie, I'm looking at your parents up in Montana. It is negative 47 wind chill right now in Northern Montana. It's negative 57, uh, and it's going to get colder. This cold air sinking in, uh, it's negative 57 degrees in Canada right now in Alberta, um, for the wind chill. Um, and it's headed South folks. Wind chill starting to drop in the South all over the continental United States. It's going to be a chilly, chilly weekend. Step into the world of power, loyalty, and luck. I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. With family, cannolis, and spins mean everything. Now, you want to get mixed up in the family business. Introducing The Godfather at ChompaCasino.com. Test your luck in the shadowy world of The Godfather slot. Someday, I will call upon you to do a service for me. Play The Godfather, now at ChampaCasino.com. Welcome to the family. VGW Group, no purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. See terms and conditions, 18 plus.